discussion then they just view the internet. Okay, I'm recording this now. Okay, I'll I'll go to another thinker who contributes to economics. Okay, so the person that I'm talking now is the contribution now of Karl Marx. Okay, so as you know, Karl Marx is known for his books, the the Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto. These are actually the famous books that he wrote, including with him uh, a, a friend of a close friend Frederick Engels. Okay, as to his life, he is a, a German philosopher and economist known for being a, a humanitarian or humanist because of his contribution to economics. As to his life, he was born in a poor Germany, Prussia before, a very known country, similar to Spain at that time. And then he observes that people are exploited, okay? Because he was born during the Industrial Revolution, he observed that people are treated like animals. He was, people are, they are not paid as an employee, regular employee now are receiving like a minimum wage and the number of hours that, they're, that they are working, they extend up to eight hours. So they are also, people are also exploited because, you know, man loves nature. But because of a need, for example, he wants to use a, a shoes or a chair. For example, he has to cut trees and kill animals. So he is alienated from his very self. And another alienation that he observed is that human nature doesn't want to work. Only that because of a need in society or in order for us to live and survive, then we have to work. So according to him, man is exploited by his very nature because the nature of man is he doesn't want to work. He is compelled to work only because he wants to have money. Okay. So the another contribution of Marx, and that is the background of his life, why, why he was so famous in economics, is another is his contribution in dialectic uh, materialism. What is this dialectic material, materialism? It's all about contradicting an idea. In order for a society to be develop, there must be a contradiction, meaning a thesis must be contradicted with what we call as the antithesis. So the result of that thesis and antithesis will be called the synthesis. The synthesis is actually a development now of the thesis and antithesis, and the result is synthesis. Okay, for example, of a thesis, government is doing well, so you have to criticize it, give an opposite um, statement that government is not doing well. So that government is not doing well is actually the contradiction or what we call as the antithesis. Now the thesis. The synthesis is now a development of which is better, okay? So you don't know which one is true, but the synthesis would mean then that it would be a development, okay? So the, the synthesis now, which is a, a correct or a, 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 a true statement now, would be again contradicted. So that synthesis would become a synth uh, thesis contradicted again with a synthesis. So later on there will be a development because the product thereof is now a synthesis. So that the, that dialectic materialism would lead to a perhaps a concrete and concise definition of what is the government doing. So it is sometimes called a conflict theory. Okay? If you notice there are groups that the job, of whose job is only to contradict. Why? Because it's on this. It's the best way to to develop a country. For it to progress, there must be a contradiction coming from the idea of the dialectic materialism. 
Now, what is conflict theory? There must be a, con a, a, a group that will oppose. In fact, in government right now, there are always, it's not only in the Philippines or other countries. Most of European countries and even Latin American countries applies this um, conflict theory that in every organization, like administration, there's always an anti-administration, okay, or what we call as the opposition. Why? Because it's only in that situation or in that scenario where government cannot just do whatever they want because there is somebody, there's a group that will contradict. Okay, so that is conflict theory. Now, as a summary, when we say conflict theory, there is always a development if there is conflict, or there is progress if there is conflict, or simply mean that there is con if there is contradiction, if there is somebody who would oppose, then there is progress. Otherwise, if there is no contradiction, then a country or an organization will not develop. Why? Because they will be doing what they whatever they want, and they don't know that it is correct. It's only when somebody would say, hey, that's not correct. When they see that indeed what they're doing is not correct. Or they can check what they, what they are doing or evaluate what they're doing. Now, okay, later on, you will know the implication of that conflict theory in the, in, in, in the government. Okay? As you notice, there are groups now that really oppose government. It actually rooted from the Marxist belief. Now, he also attacked religion. How? How did Karl Marx attack religion? He said that the religion is the opium of the economy. Okay. So later on, I know you will have many reactions why he said that. And later, we have, you will know that he also said that religion is just a pie in the sky. So going back to the first, religion is an opium of the economy. Okay. As you know, Karl Marx was born in the Industrial Revolution. Okay. He wanted that a country, his country, German, Germany, at, that, at the moment, was not actually progressing. Okay. In fact, it was suffering from a very bad economy. And he blamed it to religion. Why? Because religion, the bishops, is so close to the state, says that the state cannot do itself unless there is a blessing from the church. So, in as much as the state wanted to develop itself, but religion, the, the, the bishops at the time, was so influential, such that it cannot develop. So, it becomes stagnant. You, as you know, Germany at the time, the Prussia before, was very famous. In fact, in history, they are the successor of Britain. And, of course, Britain succeeded um, Spain. Now, so because of that, he wanted to develop the country. Okay? And the only way is to attack religion so that religion now will be detached from the state. Okay? And, the, and the leader can decide independently without the influence of the church. So the only way so that the church and state will be separated is to attack religion. So how did he attack? He said that religion is the opium of the economy. Okay. Why an opium? Because, you know, if you are a Catholic, without offense to whatever religion you have, if you believe that um, if you love your religion, perhaps you might be this, um, you may, it may not be good to hear this word. Okay. But by experience, you know that the church teaches us that if if whatever happened to us it's always the will of god okay whatever happened to you in fact your parents would say um ma, why are we poor well your parents would say that's the will of god don't don't strive for more that's the will of that is how god planned your life okay so what happened people will not do their best. So it will eventually slowly kill the economy. Similar to an opium which is found in a cigarette. Okay, a chemical in a cigarette. It will, the, the, peop, the, the person who smokes, okay, 
and perhaps taken an opium, eventually, in a long run, he is going to die. Similar to a state that if a religion is with the state or influences the state, the religion will slowly kill the economy. Okay, so that is what he said. Uh, religion is the opium of the economy. Take note, as I mentioned, he is a humanist because some of the authors would say he is a an atheist. No, he is an he is a humanist because his attack on religion is only for the good for the good of the economy. Okay, nothing more. He's not even mentioning about the existence of God. Although, if you read his life, which I have posted in the internet as well, in this. Uh, the link on, on, of his life, you can uh, realize that he was actually influenced by some atheists. But now, you can see that his influence is only for the good of the economy. Okay? Now, and the only way for the economy to progress is to attack religion. That's how we attack. Now, another statement that he was famous of is the statement that religion is a pie in the sky. Okay? A pie is a bread. It's like a, a pizza pie. Okay, a reward when you die after doing good. So similar to heaven, as you conceive it, that when you do good, you will have a reward, and that is heaven, which actually according to it only exists in the mind. Okay, it's just a pie in the sky. It is a, re a reward when you do good. Okay? It is. It is only in the sky. That is the meaning of that. If Religion is a pie in the sky. It is, it's only a reward which we create. Okay, we created, perhaps we, we cannot deny the fact that life is, that death is the end of life. So we created perhaps an, an avenue for us to be happy that in fact, when we die, it is the beginning of real life. So according to him, death um, ends, is the, is the end of everything. And, the religion we have, the belief that there is heaven, is just a pie in the sky because when you do good, you will have a reward. Okay? It's like when you do good, you will be given a certain reward or a, a bread, but it only exists in the sky. Okay? So I, I think I am and understood in that statement that religion is just a pie in the sky. These are attacks on religion. Okay? This is very vital because, you know, that influence even the state now at the present time recognizes the separation of church and state. Okay, in as much as there are other provisions of the law which also recognize uh, communist idealism. Now, the result of that is actually a, an idea of communism. Okay, actually... Uh, Karl Marx has a, a vision of a society. He calls it as a classless society. Okay? No more classes. Okay? There, eventually, there will be equality. How, how to achieve that equality? Now, in communism, it all started first with the laborers because, you know, Marx was a pro-laborer. Okay? He observes that the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, and the, the proletariat, okay? the owner of the company, the employer, and the employee, the workers, the dis distance is so great such that there is injustice. That if you own a company or if you are a capitalist, you just sit down doing nothing, but you are receiving the higher profit of the company. Whereas those who are workers or employees, they are the one who exerted the effort and yet they are paid less. In fact, at that time, they are like they are treated like a carabao. They do not have pension when they grow old. Okay, they work more than just eight hours. Okay, and they, they do not receive the benefits of workers right now. But because of Karl Marx, take note, after that, all laborers are freed. Okay. <clears throat> They have all the rights, including the right to form unions. But how? How to be equal with the employer? It all started first with 
of course, the only way for an employee to stand against the giant who is the employer is to group themselves. Okay. Lately, we have now rise of workers to form unions. It all started first with Karl Marx. Now, the only way, because you know, the employer is the giant. Okay, he owns the company, he can dismiss the employee if he doesn't like his the face. So the only way for the employees to be strong is to form themselves. Okay, and in forming, they become now equal with the giant. The giant is the employer. So there, there, there will be a fight, a struggle of the ownership such that the employees will fight against the employer and the employer will become now an employee and the employees will become an employer. And then this employer, employee now who was once an employee will fight again to regain his post. So there will be a cycle. Now, and in the cycle, there is what we call as equality. Okay, Marx is very famous for equality because he observed at that time there is really inequality. Okay. So now, be that as it may, comparing it to present time, of course, we can observe the, the inequality, more so in pandemic, that, you know, workers in government is fortunate enough. And in fact, they are the group of people who can really perhaps stand against calamity or pandemic because they are paid even if of course, some of them are on skeletal force. Some are not working and yet they are, they are paid. Okay. So while others are, of course, they do not have any means of livelihood. So they will eventually starve. So I think that is, if Marx is alive today, perhaps he would fight against equality. Okay. Now, now in, in equality, okay. You know, in it at present, if you are a, let us say, great great grand daughter of these rich people, of course you know who are these. But I will not mention because you know this is recorded. And even if you are not yet born, you already have lands, right? Because they own vast of land. But if you are just an ordinary worker like us, we are about to die, and yet we can't even pay. You pay the graveyard that we, where we will be buried later on. And that is what? Inequality. Why? Because we need the land, but we cannot own it. Okay? Because we do not have. Whereas those in the in the upper class, they, they were not yet born. And yet they can have they have no lands. So that is inequality. Now, in the end, okay, going back to the discussion of communism. In the end, this group, the workers, for example, will fight for the rights. Okay? They always demand for equality. Okay? Which is why in the present times, this group, these are actually recognized by government, the right to form unions. Okay? Like every May, they celebrated the Labor Day or the May 1. In May 1, it's a feast of a saint, a patron saint of the laborers, Saint Joseph. Okay, the carpenter or the laborer. And the, that's the time that they also propose for a salary increase. Okay? So, basing on the cost of living of a particular region as determined by the regional tripartite wages and productivity board. Now, so in, in communism, okay, they always fight for rights of workers. Okay? Now, going back to the protests and, and unions formed by laborers, they can now go to, they can demand, okay, they group themselves, okay, and these groups are even supported by a larger um, association or a labor, uh, labor organization, okay, we have the KMU, Kilosang Mayu Uno, which is uh, a day a group that celebrates every May 1. This is a, a labor group, but it's a federation actually. And some of them are 
are known to be leftist, as they say. Okay, because, you know, if you look at the origin, it actually rooted from Karl Marx. Rights of workers demand over the salary. Uh, it's a, a Marxist belief of communism, okay, of equality among workers. Now, in experience, sometimes this group would join the protests, and if they are beaten by the police, sometimes they go to the mountain, and sometimes, or some carry gun, and they are now called NPA. Okay, so the NPA actually rooted from there. Uh, um, but some there are actually just they just believe in uh, communism, especially if they are if they believe themselves that they are exploited. Okay, just they just join. But some of them originate from this one from a protest in the streets and then later on they become enemy of the government. Now, but if you look at it, they're actually fighting for equality. Okay. Now, the, the, the next step after communism is you come up with a classless society. Now, when it is now communist, okay, everything is provided for by government, it will become a classless society. That is what he view what Karl Marx view as the utopian society or a utopia, an ideal state where no more demarcation between rich and poor, all are equal. Okay? There's no more class, like all are workers. But the problem here is that a, a worker cannot just simply work without somebody who is watching him. Because by nature, of course, you know, man is lazy, only that we are compelled to work because of the reward, which is um, a monetary reward. But be it as it may, you leave him as he is, he will no longer work if there's no one watching over him. Now, between him and the watcher who is watching him for him to work is already a class. Okay? So, that can never be, there can never be a classless society. Although it's a utopia of a classless society, but it will never be a reality. But in the idea itself, the idea of communism is actually, it's a um, humanist or it has a noble intention of equality. Only that the classes that they can never be realized. But take note, most of the government right now, when we say communism, most of the institutions are owned by government. Okay? But in reality, there are actually some, some institutions are owned by government. For example, uh, there are schools that are owned by government. That is a, in a form of communism where there is equality. Those who cannot afford can, uh, can go to the school without any Efficient fee to be paid, okay? Or they are paying only a less a lesser amount. Everything is shouldered by the government. So that is in a form of government of, of communism, where most of the institutions are owned by owned by the government. The other one, which is actually similar to it, but in a little way, is called the socialism, the ownership of a private institution, and public institutions are equal okay but you know that distribution is not equal because there are portions of a, of a locality or a city where most of the institutions are owned by government okay or there are also portion of a philippine territory where most of the institutions are owned by a private individual okay but in as a, a general view of the philippine itself it's more of a capitalistic okay, or capitalism where those who are who owns a company or those who are private individual who has a a capital can put up a a company okay or do business well it is in care is because you know in capitalism There is a competition which is needed and very helpful 
helpful to the economy. Unlike in communism where eventually people will just depend in government and they become passive. Why? Because they will not depend on, they just depend on the government. Okay, so in capitalism, well, everything is so competitive. If you cannot comp compete in the market, then your, your product will not be sold. Okay, so in capitalism, which is an op opposite of communism, there is a possibility or greater possibility that, that if you can, if you do your best, you will become a rich man. Okay, whereas in communism, probably there's a tendency that you end up um, doing nothing okay? because you just rely on, on government. Now, I know you have comment, but you just write your comment in, in a piece of paper okay? or in, um, send it in the comment box after this slide. Now, I'm done with the life of Marx. Now I'm going to, by the way, Marx died in, he was buried in London, okay, United Kingdom. And before he, he died, he actually um, group. He formed so many labor groups to fight for the rights of the workers. He was interviewed many times, but police officers ran after him. Okay, because he, he said that he actually joined a, a subversive government um, group that will overthrow the government. So, but his intention is only for equality of workers. So, his friend in Ingalls is the one who supported him for the publication of his books, okay, the Communist Manifesto and the Das Capital. He died there. His wife was serves as his secretary is the one who she's the one who um, write the manuscript or perhaps type but it was Ingels who contributed for financially for the production or reproduction of the manuscript now I'll show you another slide okay the so that you will you can see the picture of Marx Okay. Um, I'll show you again. Okay, this is this is found in Wikipedia, so that you you can see the picture of Marx. Okay. So this is the picture of Marx. He was born in May 15, 1818, in Germany. Okay. So he is a sociologist, historian, and economist. Okay. So these are the books that I had mentioned, Communist Manifesto. So he's actually a great philosopher in Germany. There's one a video here. I don't know if you can I, just a background so that you will understand how Karl Marx behaved. Okay, here. I don't. Can you see this one? Yes, sir. Let's <laughs> get Sixty Second Adventures in Religion. Number one, religion as social control. 
Karl Marx was a German philosopher, economist, and the least funny of the Marxists. In the snappily titled Contribution to the Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right, he famously called religion the opium of the people, in that religion was not only used by those in power to oppress the workers, but it also made them feel better about being oppressed when they couldn't afford real opium. He thought that if the comfort blanket of religion was taken away, at last the workers would have to do something about their terrible condition. In Marx's dream of a communist revolution, religion would be abolished and the workers would be so happy being equal, they simply wouldn't need it anymore. But unfortunately for Marx, the revolution in Russia came after he had died and gone to wherever it is that atheists go. And by then, Stalin and his gang had proved there were lots of other ways to oppress people which didn't have any of the fun bits of religion, or indeed opium. <laughs> Okay, so that's it for for today. Okay, you uh, make a comment okay, based on on the discussion I have. I know you have so many questions. For a while.